Hi, my name is Kristina Hiukka and I'm the founder of Women in Innovation Summit. The summit is taking place here in Seattle on September 22nd. And today I have a rare opportunity to have uh, three women leaders who are the innovators and leaders of innovation here with me to talk about what it takes to be a leader in innovative, cutting edge businesses. Carol. Yes. Hi. Hi. You are one heck of an innovator and you partner with innovators around the world to make this world a better place. Mm. Why don't you say something about what, what you actually do and where, do you, where, where does that work take you? Well, I guess the arena that my innovation is in is how it is you really change the way we innovate human systems so that they can affect other systems in a more uh, powerful way. Because what I see right now is that the way we work with human beings limits innovation. It stops creativity and that's because it stops the connection with what we deeply care about and our ability to contribute and make a difference. I have been very blessed to work with some of the most amazing entrepreneurs and leaders in the world who decided they want to really change how they work with people, change how they run their business. And so that's what I have done is work with them in redesigning how businesses do strategy and work design and all things that relate to a business. That's great. And you've, you've written books about it too. I have. I've written a lot of books and a lot of articles um, and I have a new book coming out. Uh, the, the shift in books has been, the first one was really uh, half of the companies that were, were very large, like DuPont and Colgate, who I work with, and Yahoo, and um, who have made a difference where large numbers of people work, and they have huge impacts on the planet. And then the other half of the book is really more about entrepreneurs who are either, uh, not so much startups, but they're serial entrepreneurs, or they're ready to take on something. So the new book is dedicated just to entrepreneurs, what I call the responsible entrepreneur. And the first book is The Responsible Business. So that's Carol Sanford. Pamela, you are a serial entrepreneur. You take in a lot of innovations to, uh, to businesses and you've, you've patented, I don't know, how many patents do you hold? Um, several. Several? <laughs> around 35. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, Christina, you know, I started out as a scientist and um, so I was not really considered an innovator, but I'm an inventor. And um, I prefer to call myself a repeat entrepreneur because serial entrepreneur has other connotations. And um, so I have started um, two companies that are still ongoing. One I took public and um, Xenogen Corporation that then was uh, merged with Caliber Life Sciences, then was bought by Perkin Elmer. And um, cobalt biofuels, which is in demonstration phase for um, biobutanol. And um, so my innovation experience came from trying to find the application for a specific invention and thinking, really, how do you use this in a way different from possibly what I intended when I did the invention? And uh, that has led me to think widely about what does innovation mean and maybe more importantly, as you guys know, how do you teach innovation? Because it's not something you can really teach. Scientists, we grew up as you know, individual contributors. And to branch out and think about how do you take something from the bench top to commercialization with an innovative idea that people can actually use in their everyday lives is a, is a, a different academic endeavor. Pamela Contag, you also founded Startup Washington. And, uh, and I mean, Startup America, actually. You were one of the co-founders, right? So I sit on the founding board of Startup America Partnership. And the Startup America Partnership is really a coalition of entrepreneurs. You know, it's by entrepreneurs, for entrepreneurs. And our goal is to establish um, Startup America in each region of the United States, beginning with states um, and this week I'm here helping Washington State celebrate their own launch of Startup America Partnership, which is really exciting. Yeah. We're so glad you're here. Jill, you, okay, let's take a break. Sure, sure. Wow, he's got to redo his route. Oh my goodness. That's a powerful, powerful guy. Yes, yeah. <laughs> impressive. <laughs> 
I thought the rain, the mail stopped for nothing. <laughs> okay. So, Jill, Pam just, Pamela just talked about uh, teaching uh, entrepreneurs about innovation. You've written a book about scaling uh, and not losing your heart in the process, right? Right. Yeah, and that's been one of my passions. Is uh, The title of the book is called Getting to Scale, Growing Your Business Without Selling Out. And that means without either selling out on your values or selling out to a larger firm uh, because you needed to achieve additional capital or additional liquidity or somehow or other wanted to move on in your business or additional distribution, which is another one that costs a lot of people to, to sell their businesses. But um, it is possible to uh, grow businesses to significant size without selling out the values, and there's some tricks to it. Yeah. Um, the biggest trick, just to cut to the chase, the biggest trick is don't take money from the wrong people. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest issue. Um, and there are some new corporate forms that are starting to support uh, the idea of businesses with a social mission as well as a for-profit mission. Uh, and there's a, a fantastic new book out called The uh, Shareholder Myth by one named Lynn Stout that really refutes the idea that's an idea fixé in all of our heads that the purpose of the corporation is to maximize shareholder value. And she claims, and I think rightfully so, that that is in fact a myth that we have brought upon ourselves and we don't have to run our businesses that way and we shouldn't run our businesses that way. Yes, and you teach that at right. the Bainbridge Graduate Institute, right? Right, right. I'm one of the co-founders there and we're uh, 10 years into our grand experiment now. Uh, our 500th graduate uh, across the stage in June, which is a big milestone for us. And, um, Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's uh, wonderful to see what they're going out and doing now. And I, I don't know whether we educate innovators, but we certainly um, participate in their lives and encourage them on their journey. Well, you certainly attract a lot of people who have, uh, have their heart in the right place and they have great ideas how to make the world better, a better place, right? Right. And our addition to that is to help them in two areas. One is to acquire basic business skills because whether you have a social mission or not, it's hard to be successful in business and there are some things that people need to know about that. And the other is to help them develop their leadership skills so that they can uh, persuade others who are working for them or working with them in creating a better world to come along and, and, and join. And that leadership development uh, is the thing that most of our students say is, is really, in some ways, the most important thing they get from us. Yes. You all are exemplary leaders in your fields. And, and uh, I'm wondering, what, is, what would you say is propelling you to keep doing this? Uh, it, you're all kind of pioneers in, in your fields and what you do. And innovation and invent, inventing is always a pioneering act. What is the, pro, the energy and the, the passion that propels you? What if the future mattered? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. I mean, um, I have children and grandchildren, and I raised other children that were not mine by birth, and have their children, I call my grandchildren. And I am very conscious all the time of the degradation that we do of life, of the life that's around us, as well as the life of children being able to really be inventive and creative. And I actually do think you can teach, we'll come back to that in a minute. I think you can teach innovation, and I think you can develop innovation, and they're not the same thing, but they're parts of it. And so I think what drives me is that I believe human beings have an innate desire to contribute, to do something really great, and we've, messed up all of the systems that normally would help them learn to do that. Everything from parenting to schools to jobs and so we may as well work on getting it so that we actually have a future. Do you know, Pamela, the moment or can you remember the moment when you were really sparked to invent? Um, a single moment. I don't know if it's a single moment. I, I know of all the moments throughout my life where I said, oh, this is new. You know, this might not have been done before. I should check and see if it's really new. And if it's really new, I should tell somebody about it, whether it's my mom <laughs> or my professor or whoever is interested in new things. 
And I think what happens to those of us that are interested in invention and innovation, sometimes we don't have anybody to tell. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I think that is yeah. really... Or they think we're nuts if we do that. They are, that doesn't actually bother me. <laughs> 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 I can tell somebody. They're right. They're right. They're they're right. right. But I also really agree with Jill. I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, you... It, whether you call it invention or innovation, you drive your company forward and if you build the best company, the best application for whatever it is you're trying to produce, if you make that company the best company it can be, the shareholder value will follow. Yeah. And I think, I think that's what we have to concentrate on. Yeah. But to do that, you have to be able to you know, communicate, articulate you know, your values and the culture you want within the company. And you have to stand by that. And I think that tends to be where people lose energy, is there's a lot of pressure to have a template a certain way. And I think the reason we gather as women, Startup America, you know, other organizations, um, is to ask, is there a better template? And what can we do today to, to change those um, blocking forces that we have to hurdle over, you know, every time we want to do something differently? So, I'm there because I always see a new way around the brick wall. Do you think that's uh, that's an inherent in you that you've been like that, seeing the opening in the brick wall all your life? I don't know. You have to ask the teachers. Who responds to me? What brick wall? Yeah, right, yeah, right, right, exactly. I know yeah. it's there, but <laughs> yeah, I do think it starts very young, though. Um, and I think if you're lucky, it gets cultured. Because I remember as early as four years old, noticing things that didn't feel right was yeah. my first notice. I mean, like, I'm not sure that's the way. I mean, my father was very racist. And so I would notice his treatment of people, and it, it would hurt. And so I remember thinking there's got to be another way to think about this. And then there were other things that were very exciting. But there's something I think starts young. And if it's nourished, it gets, mm -hmm. you get to keep going. Do you um, work with students who cultivate their leadership, like what Pamela was saying before, that you have to cultivate the values in your organization? Um, how do you cultivate innovativeness? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I think Carol wants to address it because she's alluded to it earlier. <laughs> Not today, yeah. Over tea. <laughs> I think from our standpoint, um, we, ha we have a class called Creativity and Right Livelihood, which is basically looking at helping people to develop their own creativity. And the assumption of that class is that it may have been beaten out of you early on yeah. in your life, but it's still in there someplace. And there are some things that you can do to cultivate that. And part of that is developing a non-judgmental atmosphere in which new ideas are welcomed mm -hmm. and people are supported for thinking differently um, and uh, uh, encouraged to follow their dreams um, as opposed to have that beaten out of them because it's not practical. Mm. Do you see uh, a difference between men and women in that? Um, I certainly see a difference between men and women in terms of uh, entrepreneurship. And um, this would be in the population as a whole rather than just students. And I see a lot of women being driven to entrepreneurship by a desire to feed their kids. Yeah. Okay? I mean, yeah. they, they, they want to build a business so that they can um, co cover their livelihood. I see men being more motivated frequently by dreams of grandness or solving a big problem or making a mark in the world or something of that sort. And that's not to say that you know there aren't exceptions on either side of that, mm -hmm. but to me, I, I, I see something of a difference in the motivation. Now, our students um, on both sides of the gender balance uh, are motivated by a desire to use the mechanism of business to achieve some sort of good in the world. Um, and that's uh, a common point. But I, I'd be interested in what others say. Uh, do you see differences between men and women? So, so um, I've been in front of a lot of investors. I've had a lot of male colleagues. I'm in a, a science and technology field, so most of my colleagues are male. And as far as being an entrepreneur, I think they're driven by the same thing at, at many levels where I'm at. Um, but I understand your point of view that it is an option to be your own 
person and how you flex the time and you make your way, which generally appeals to people that are um, uh, less risk averse. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where I see the difference is the way men and women respond to all entrepreneurs, whereas I see less of a difference between male and female entrepreneurs, but maybe simply in my sector. And I think, I think one thing we were discussing before we started the panel is, is the self-esteem issue. I mean, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to have um, a good network that can help you support your self-esteem, whether you're male or female. And sometimes women don't have that, and they tend to doubt themselves more frequently and maybe um, hesitate when they should be pushing forward. Whereas men have more experience developing that sort of network because of maybe the activities they participate in as they're growing up, or maybe there's more male role models, um, but they don't, they don't seem to have that self-esteem problem that causes them to hesitate at the critical What's been the key for you to develop your self-esteem and your confidence? <laughs> That's a really hard question. Um, you know, I had a great network. I grew up in a gigantic family. There was always somebody there to listen to me and, you know, give me the go fight win and say, hey, yeah, that sounds really cool. And then they'd join in. You know, it wasn't, it, it, they allowed me to be a leader. They pushed me to be a leader. Um, they were great, you know, uh, colleagues and co-workers just in my, you know, immediate group. And then as I went through um, high school and college, I will say I went to an all women's college, um, and I think that made a huge difference. There was never an issue about um, pleasing would, boys. <laughs> well, or who would who would be the person to step forward to prove it was always going to be a woman? You know, why not me? And I saw the difference there when I that I went. Uh, I got my PhD at the University of Minnesota, and you know I could see that there was a difference um, in the way I acted versus the way maybe other women acted because I didn't know anything. About except stepping up, getting the job done, and doing uh, the best job I could possibly do. And that turned out to be a very successful you know, experience for me in the university. And then I moved down into my postdoc at Stanford University. And again, I had that background of just no fear. I don't know how to really explain it. Yeah. It's you know, total support. Total support. I was very lucky. How did that come? I would say I have a, I, I have a, a related but different window yes. than they do. Um, and part of it is when I said I think you can develop innovation, I think innovativeness in people. Uh, I also agree with Jill that it's a lot of it. You're getting it back alive. But one of the most important things I think you have to develop and redevelop and reawaken is personal agency. And I think that's highly correlated with self-esteem. And personal agency, you know, is having the sense of will and the sense of I can make a difference. And we don't develop that. In fact, in fact, I think sometimes when we work on the self-esteem side, we actually don't work on the, self, the, the personal agency side. And for me, I tend not to put people in careful environments. I put them in ones where they're deeply loved and then they get relentless caring. I call it, where I am pushing very hard on people. You've, I mean, I don't do anything in a way that is, is what normally would be considered nurturing by a woman, but it is totally nurturing in that I will not go away until they've gotten where they need to be and what they need to think about. And I don't care whether that's male or female. I mean, in, in the set, and I will spend time asking questions I know they can't answer, they're going to be uncomfortable with, and then give them the, the skills and the tools to be able to work on that so that they learn to manage it. And that's where, to me, the self-esteem comes from. I got that. And it turned me around on a dime from the insecure person who had no idea how to deal with the world that I had and the kind of things that were happening to me. I was 34 years old before I woke up. And that's what happened. It was reawakening that agency about what do I want to do in the world and how do I get what it takes to have the steadfastness to keep going and doing that. So it's related. My kids call that Pam School of Tough Love. Yeah, ex yeah, yeah. <laughs> tough love. It's, it's a very yeah, similar yeah, idea, yeah. except that it has skill built into it, right? So it's a really oh, yeah. capability, right? And I'm sure. The girls got to have skills. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a, a memory of what was the pivotal moment or person who, oh, yeah. who brought that agency oh, yeah. to you? And it's interesting because it was a man. Yes. And it was probably necessary because it was a man who had spent my life helping me undo it, my father. 
right? And who just didn't have skills. I mean, he was a good human being trying to do something in the world, but he was just 